Logging Apache Spark, because nothing is as easy as it seems. So what are we going to talk about in the next 12 minutes? We'll start with a brief overview of Nielsen's data architecture. Uh, we'll then talk about how and when we used to access Spark logs. Uh, a deep dive into the solution overview that actually provided us with log visibility. Some main obstacles, because every solution has to have an obstacle. Um, some pretty key bunch of charts, and to topple it up, um, some future and add ons. Uh, but first, the most important thing who am I? So, who am I? Uh, I'm Simona. I'm 29 years old. I'm joining you here from Israel. I'm a big data engineer at ADOC. I love data. I've been dealing with data for uh, the past 10 years now, which feels like a lot. I love music. I love Japan and I love traveling. So, basically, this is me in a picture. So I think the first thing that really pops up uh, when you look at this architecture is Spark. More than 50 terabytes, billions of events flow into this architecture daily, and all of that data um, gets deserialized, enriched, aggregated, and eventually stored in each one of these uh, different data stores, all done by Spark. Um, so a big job of being a data engineer at Nielsen Israel would be just developing and maintaining these big, robust Spark jobs and Apache Spark streaming applications. And it would be really important to mention that at the time we were running Spark on what was or um, maybe still is the most popular way to run Spark, which is just Amazon EMR. So when we start our discussion of when and how, how we used to access logs, I, um, I think the most important thing to talk about first would be um, when we need to access logs. And we need to access logs in one of uh, probably two cases. So the first one would be when you launch a new Spark, up, Spark application um, and you just want to follow it up, right? And you want to access the logs. And then the second one would be when you have a production issue. So you have a production issue, you might know that the problem is with Spark or you might not, but essentially you need to access the logs. And in both of these cases, time is an essence. So how did we access logs? How do you access logs when you run Spark on EMR? Um, so the first way would be just SSHing directly to the server. Um, so EMR, basically a bunch of EC2 servers running together. Um, and as we all know, Spark has several components and several components that are outputting logs, right? We have the driver, we have uh, the tasks and when you want to access a log in such a way, you really need to pinpoint the EC2 server that your log resides on. You have to SSH there, find the right folder, find the right log file, decompress it, access it, start searching it, and really hope that the logs that you're looking for are actually there. Um, then you do have a centralized way to access your logs. You can do that through the Yarn UI. Um, so just pick up your favorite web browser, um, and access your logs there. Uh, but if we think about when we actually need to access our logs, uh, then probably our application was already running for some time now and the logs are getting pretty big. And so when you try and access your logs this way through the Yarn UI, uh, most of the times your web browser just crashes and dies. Uh, and then you go to the final way of accessing uh, Spark logs when running them on EMR, and that would be just downloading your log files off of S3. So Amazon do provide us with this possibility. They migrate the log files from the EC2 servers uh, they're outputted to and then to S3. Um, but there's quite a delay there. There's quite a lag. And we really wanted a solution that would make log access really quick and really easy and will help us uh, just search these logs with ease. Um, and this is exactly why we designed a solution based on the ELK stack um, with Beats, uh, really being the star of this architecture. So for those of you who are not familiar with Beats, Beats are open source, lightweight shippers. Um, each one is dedicated to a different type of log. So really what we're going to do here is we're going to install two shippers. We're going to install FileBeat for uh, Spark log data. We're also going to install MetricBeat because if we're already there, then why not collect these metrics off of the EC2 servers? Um, we're going to install them using bootstrap actions on each one of the EC2 servers on the EMR. Uh, from there, the data is going to flow to Redis. Um, several logs or servers 
uh, are then collecting, reading that data off of Redis, indexing it in Elasticsearch, and then finally, of course, Kibana for visualization and search. So what we're going to do now is really do a deep dive into the solution or more like how we actually came to install Filebee in metric B um, in the right way on all of these EC2 servers. And we'll start off by talking about Bootstrap Actions. And what you see before you is actually just taken off of Amazon's documentation. So essentially, you can use Bootstrap Actions in order to install additional software on the EC2 servers in the EMR. And what I have before you now is just a snippet off of our own uh, Bootstrap Actions configured for this solution. So we have here the metric B, right? Um, and also the bootstrap action for the file B. Each one of them is going to run a different bash script. Each one is getting different configuration variables. Um, and we're really going to go into these configuration variables in just a minute, don't worry. Uh, so let's really deep dive into this bash script. So the first thing that we need to do when we install file B um, on, on our EMRs is just make sure that we're not running on the master uh, server. Why is that? Well, basically because Spark is not running on the master server. So just installing FileBeat on that one would just be useless. Um, luckily for us, the information is provided by Amazon. It resides on the server. And so we're just gonna make sure that that's not the case and we'll move on. And the second thing we will do is actually yeah, receive those configuration variables. And at this point, I would like to say that we have two types. The first type I will call um, for the future. And then the second one I will call for the legacy. Uh, so what would be for the future variables? For the future variables are variables that you use to make your logs more searchable, thinking about the future, right? And, and that would be things like team name and flow name, um, really more extra data that will make all of your logs more searchable. Um, and then the legacy variables really have to do with what um, Nielsen's data department looked like. Um, so at the time, we really had only one data team. As, and as it happens really, really often, that one data team grew up to be three data teams. And each one of these data teams used a different log for J file um, for their Spark applications. And so instead of forcing all of them to change your log for J files and work in a standardized way with one log for J file, we said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything. We'll provide you with the possibility to configure your file beat in just the way that suits your own log for J file. No worries. So that's exactly the legacy variables. So if you look at line regular expression or log file name, these are configuration variables just to avoid all that work, all that additional work that you'd have to do on your log for J file. Um, so the next thing after receiving the configuration variable, the next thing that we're gonna do is just wait for Java to be installed on the server. If you go back to my slide on Bootstrap Actions, um, you'll discover that Amazon, they although they run these steps in order to install additional software, they actually do that before they install their own software on the EC2 servers. Um, and so we really do need to have Java in the, on the servers in order to install um, Filebeat and MetricBeat. So we're just gonna wait for that one to be installed and then we'll actually start the script. So at this point, we're going to just go on and download the RPM file off of Elastic, um, open it up, install it. And now what we have to do is configure our file B. And we are going to do it using the configuration variables we got. So what we did, we actually just created a template um, file B YAML. Uh, we're going to edit that one using said uh, and the configuration variables we got. And then the output of the said command will be a file bit YAML that our file bit can use. So such a template file will look just like this, right? Um, and I wanna draw your attention to the multi-line pattern variable. So that's really one that's dedicated to legacy, right? To just making every team work with its own lock for J file. And then the second variable I really wanna draw your attention to would be the EMR cluster ID. Um, so Using the MR cluster ID, that's the most recent information that you have in regards to your application. And just using this variable 
um, in order to search your logs in the future, um, that would pr prove to be really, really useful. So we're going to install metric B in a really similar way. Um, there's nothing, nothing really different here. Uh, and at this point, our solution is pretty much done. So now we have FileBeat and MetricB installed using a custom installation. Um, it's really custom on the bootstrap action level. Um, you don't really have to configure your log stash too much because these are FileBeat and, and MetricB, uh, and they natively work with log stash and Elastic. So what would be our one main obstacle? So our one main obstacle would be data engineers. And I think data engineers suffer from a lot of problems that just regular uh, software engineers suffer from. Um, and that would be uh, all this good, right? Uh, SSHing to servers, that's what I like. Why do I need to configure bootstrap actions? That is just work. Change is work. Um, so that was the obstacle that we had, but eventually we did overcome it and everyone started using Kibana in order to just access and search their logs. So this is a chart um, really visualizing your logs and you can see that you have uh, 34,000, over 34,000 warning, um, like log, log level warning logs, and then you have 23 uh, logs with the uh, log level error. And that's really nice. I, I really think visualizing your logs uh, with all of these charts, that's really cool. That's really nice. Um, but this is a real star for me. Um, so if you look at the message line, uh, here in red, that's what we were aiming to achieve. That's our log line. Everything else is a bonus. Um, so you, you have EMR cluster ID here. That's a bonus. That's a bonus for you to be able to search your logs with more ease. Uh, you have the tags here. So that's the flow name. That's the team name. Now every team can just go into Kibana, search their team names, and get all the logs from all of their applications tagged with their team name. Um, so that's a real star for me. And so if we talk about some future and add-ons, I think the first thing that we do for the future um, is just replace Redis with Kafka. So at the, at the beginning, when we were just designing this, we decided to use Redis. But as we've added more and more applications to this architecture and collected more and more logs, uh, Redis really became a bottleneck. And, and Kafka is more robust. Uh, and I think it will really provide this architecture um, with a better, better design, a better solution. And then the second thing would be just collecting more data from more EC2 based services. Uh, so at Nielsen Israel, we were running Druid and Kafka and Schema Registry, all of these services self managed uh, on EC2 servers. Um, and essentially, EMR is just a bunch of EC2 servers running together. Uh, so if you just get your file bit and metric bit installed uh, on these EC2 servers, then you can just collect more and more information. And so that's it. And at this point, I just want to thank you for joining my lightning talk. And I just hope that it will make your log search in the future um, more easy, easier and more useful. Thank you.